A reliable 20 minute test, how much of a game changer will that be? Well, being able to expand mass testing with these new technologies it is a, a huge positive step forward in our battle against the virus. If you think about it, a combination of everybody doing social distancing and then testing to find out where the virus is, is our best way of avoiding having to do uh, local lockdowns and our best way of keeping the virus under control. So, you know, at the moment, if you take a test, the swab goes in your throat, it has to go off to the lab, we get most of them back the next day, but changing that to something where you can just ha have some saliva and 20 minutes later you've got the result, that means we can have many, many more people tested and also you can just get the result fast and know that you are COVID safe. And how do we access their tests? Well, we're dealing with about 100 different testing companies at the moment who are, have got new innovative technologies. Uh, and when those tests uh, work, we're always putting them through rigorous trials because obviously uh, the tests have to work. Um, we're then rolling them out. And that's one of the things that we're announcing today, putting half a billion pounds more into these innovative new next generation tests and then rolling them out in a way that helps control uh, the virus. So for instance, in Salford, in Greater Manchester, um, we're, we're taking the testing right into the centre of town so that everybody can get a test and we can find out uh, anybody who is asymptomatic, doesn't have symptoms, uh, but has coronavirus. And likewise, you can then start to think about how you can use this for much more uh, ways of opening things up and, and getting life uh, back to normal because people will be able to know quickly uh, whether or not they've got coronavirus and therefore have the confidence, knowing that they don't have it if they get a negative test, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to go about more normal life. Mm. So, once you can access the test, it'll take 20 minutes. How do you access the test is what my viewers will want to know this morning. Yes, yeah, so the new innovative test that we are backing today essentially have the lab in the back of a van. So that can go to an area where there's a high number of, um, uh, where there's an outbreak, high number of cases, uh, and test large numbers of people and they get the result on the spot. There are, there are other uh, new technologies coming on where in fact uh, you get the, um, th that could be done but sent to your home instead. Um, and we're working with those companies to try to get those uh, ramped up to scale. Uh, so that we can uh, so, uh, so that we can roll them out. So all of this is about taking, you know, the, uh, as you said in the intro, a massive growth in our testing capabilities, and we've hit all the targets that we set for the growth of testing uh, during this coronavirus. Um, and it, it, uh, and obviously we want to go much further with mass testing. Okay, but. Um, as of today, if you wanted a test on the NHS, um, I put my postcode in um, the, the website app and it's 100 miles I have to travel to have uh, a test. That's not satisfactory, is it? That's rubbish, in fact. Well, this is one of the, it's one of the reasons that we're, uh, we're investing so much more in new testing and these new technologies can really change that. Because at the moment, the system, the system works well. Of course, there's uh, operational challenges uh, from time to time, but it works well. Um, and we're finding a higher and higher proportion of the people in the country who have uh, coronavirus and getting them uh, those, uh, those tests so that they can be properly looked after. Um, but absolutely, you know, uh, we, need to, we need to roll out more testing. We have done throughout this crisis. Uh, and, um, and, and today is another step in solving some of those, uh, the problems with the existing uh, technology, which has to, as I say, go off to the lab and come back and you have to go uh, to that drive through centre, which sometimes can be a bit so of a how drive. long? So how long before I don't have to drive 100 miles for a test? Uh, well, uh, we're starting that uh, today uh, with in, in Salford and the expansion of the tests, uh, the trials that we've done on this in uh, Southampton, and then we're rolling it out uh, across the country. So, so um, it's starting from today in some parts of the country and then rolling out across the country in the weeks and months to come. OK, what if I'm coming back through one of the big airports? Can I have a test there? Well, uh, the challenge with quarantine is that because the virus incubates for uh, up to two weeks, 
if people get a test when they get off the plane, there's only a very small chance that that will catch the virus, even if they've got it. Um, and the experts tell us, the scientists tell us that that chance is about 7%. And that means that, that, that that's why you have to quarantine. And I, you know, I know our quarantine policy um, caused a few um, uh, ripples when we introduced it a few months ago, and quite a few people were unhappy with it. But if you've seen what's happened in America, Brazil, India, and now in France and Spain and other parts of Europe, the quarantine policy has protected this country. It does mean that we have to, you know, sometimes make some swift decisions uh, when we reintroduce quarantine in a country where the case rate is shooting up. But we do it to protect this country, and I think the quarantine policy has absolutely proved its worth. OK. Um, should I go to Portugal tomorrow, or will I have to quarantine when I come back? Well, what I'd say is that everybody has seen that we are prepared to take decisions to put individual countries uh, back on the quarantine list uh, if that's what is necessary. Um, and we keep this constantly under review. Uh, and then we announce the decisions usually on a, on a Friday lunchtime. Um, so people should look at the data, but also should only travel if they are prepared to quarantine. If things, you know, if the, frankly, if the virus goes up when they're in that country, unfortunately, we do have to take these decisions to keep people here safe. No, it's not going to change between t today and tomorrow, though, is it, um, Health Secretary? You're, here's an opportunity for the government to be ahead of the curve for my viewers who are potentially going to Portugal tomorrow. Will they be able to go without quarantine when they come back or not? Simple question. And the simple answer is that we follow the data and we make these announcements in an organised way on a, on a Friday lunchtime. So you don't know. Well, that's not true because uh, when it came to Spain, it was a Saturday. So, um, it, you know, it is very fluid. Are you saying that you don't yet know? That you don't yet know. Well, you raise a really good point about Spain, which is that the case rate was shooting up very, very rapidly in Spain. So we did have to act very fast. And I'm, I'm so glad that we did because... You know, the number of cases just carried on going up in Spain. It was really important that we took that action to keep people here safe. You know, and one of the challenges in this coronavirus for all of us, frankly, is that you know, the, 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 inf the data changes. This virus... Uh, Health it, it, Secretary, it, it, as you it, know, we it, only it, have a limited amount of time. If you could answer my question, if people are thinking about going to Portugal tomorrow, I'm sure you know by now, should they go or not, or do you not yet know? We're going to publish a further decision tomorrow, having looked at the data, and I, I'm not going to um, prejudge that. I'm telling you that there is a, you know, the government looks very carefully at all the data and then makes these decisions and publishes them in an organised way, and I'm going to stick to that principle. Something that you will know about, and I'm sure you will want to comment on, is Tony Abbott. I can see that you're wearing your NHS Pride badge. Uh, I wear mine with pride, is what you've tweeted previously. Tony Abbott, who was the former Prime Minister of Australia, so I'm suggesting that he may well be potentially a US, uh, UK trade ambassador. He says he feels threatened by homosexuality. He also says elderly people should have been left to die naturally from COVID and men are better set to exercise authority than women. Is he the right sort of person to represent us? Well, uh, as far as I understand it, the proposal is that... Um, uh, Mr Abbott supports the UK on trade policy, which is an area in which he's got a huge amount of expertise. You know, I, I bow to nobody in my uh, support for everybody to, uh, to, to love who they love, uh, whoever that is. And, and, um, uh, 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 and, and uh, well, as, uh, as you know, and as we've talked about uh, a lot, but I think, you know, we, want, we need to have the best experts in the world in their, working in their field. Um, and as the former Prime Minister of Australia, obviously Mr Abbott has got a huge amount of experience. Even if he's a homophobic misogynist? Well, I, I'm, I think that that is... Uh, I, I don't think that's uh, true. Uh, I, don't, I haven't I've seen I've just told you what he said. He, I'm sure you don't support some of his comments. He's a homophobe and he's a misogynist. Well, uh, he's also an expert in uh, trade. So one plays off against the other? Really? Is that really what you're saying, Health Secretary? Come on. Well, no, what I'm saying is that we need experts in uh, different areas uh, and um, somebody who's the former Prime Minister of Australia uh, is uh, obviously an enormous expert in the, uh, in the field of 
of trade, it doesn't change my views. OK, so we can forgive his comments about women and about letting the elderly die of COVID-19 and about uh, his views on um, uh, the gay community, even though he, I believe his sister is gay. We can forgive all of that because he's good at trade. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm doing everything in my power uh, to prevent a second wave and protect people from coronavirus. Health Secretary, but, uh, not my question. We've, we've spent eight minutes talking about that. I'm asking you about whether this is a fit and proper person to represent us as far as trade is concerned, given the views that he holds. Well, look, I think, Kay, the best um, thing to say is that I am totally focused on the coronavirus crisis and the future of the NHS and of social care. That is my area, right? I do know that Mr Abbott is very good and very experienced in trade. It is clearly um, a, a very important uh, decision uh, that the Prime Minister and the Trade Secretary are across uh, because we do want experts, absolutely, and people who have huge experience, especially when we're putting together an area of policy in trade that, frankly, has been given over to the EU for the last um, 35 years. Yeah. Okay. So there's a good reason there. But, okay. but, but, you know, my, but I've been obviously totally focused on, uh, on the health area, as you'll entirely understand. As I, I put it to the former health secretary yesterday, uh, and I put it to you as well as a forward-thinking 21st century man. You might have a view on that. You obviously don't. I know we're out of time. I just wanted to ask you very quickly about migrants. Uh, the hostile environment policy uh, clearly isn't working. 500 migrants making the crossing uh, yesterday, almost double what we'd seen in a single day previously. What are we going to do about that? Well, there's clearly two things that we need to do. Uh, we need to stop the migrants coming from France, and if they come, um, then we need to have arrangements to return them. France is an extremely civilised country. Uh, I can see absolutely no reason why anybody uh, should have to cross uh, from France in an illegal way. And I know the Home Secretary is working incredibly hard on this.